There we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. If I could ask you to take your seats. We realize during spring meetings week, people will wander in and out, but I hope you realize during spring meetings week, a major economy minister's time is very much under threat. Um, it is my personal pleasure to welcome back an old friend, not old, but longtime friend. Um, <laughs> I'm the one who's getting older, Pierre Carlo Padawan, um, who is, of course, the Minister of Economy and Finance for Italy. Um, he was appointed to be the Minister of Economy and Finance in the government led by Matteo Renzi uh, now more than two years ago, in February 2014. Thank God this was after the worst of the international economic crisis, but it has been a time of great change and challenge in Italy as well and we're grateful to have Pier Carlo's leadership in this role. Many of us knew him in his previous capacity as Deputy Secretary General of the OECD from 2007 to 2014, and he managed to double hat that for most of the time also as the Chief Economist of the OECD. I, don't know uh, I barely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, since I can barely keep up with this job, I don't know how Fred did his, uh, I, I shudder at the thought of doing two but you did both of them, and successfully. Um, from 2001 to 2005, he generated many of his friends here in Washington as the Italian Executive Director at the International Monetary Fund when he chaired a number of board committees. And prior to that, he had served as an economic advisor, concentrating international economic policies to the Italian Prime Ministers Massimo da Alema and Giuliano Amato. Um, Minister, Minister Padoan is here primarily today because he has released a new report, or I should say, it's more than an essay, so I'm not sure what the formal title should be, a very thoughtful piece on the future of Europe and the way forward. Uh, that piece, for all our friends watching online, will be available on the website, uh, along with the video and transcript of the remarks today, and we encourage people to download it and read it at their leisure. But since Pier Carlo Padawan knows no leisure, I will now ask him to speak. Mr. Minister. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much, David, for the, your kind words. It's always nice to be here. And uh, believe me, I take this hour spent here at Peterson as a moment of relief, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to share with you a document which was produced by the Ministry of Economy and Finance, and of course, uh, also discussed uh, with the government, with the Italian government, on uh, a European policy strategy for grow jobs and stability. Now, uh, why a document now for, on Europe, and why the emphasis on growth and jobs? The motivation, like many documents uh, produced by governments, I guess, is mostly political. Um, we are convinced that Europe is facing a deep, a deep crisis in, in the sense of multiple challenges uh, addressing Europe, uh, which are translating themselves into decreasing support at the political level for the European idea, so that, uh, like we say often, many, Ita many European citizens, and indeed some Italian citizens as well, tend to see Europe as part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And uh, this risks slipping out of control. So this document is uh, about proposing a strategy for reverting that, addressing the main uh, challenges that Europe is facing, and starting from the already important infrastructure and policy uh, uh, array that Europe has at its disposal. The purpose is, on the one hand, to redirect policy and emphasis and, and strategy, and, the other, and on the other hand, look at what can be added with different layers of complexity and institutional difficulty, so to speak, so that uh, Europe uh, moves towards uh, more growth, more jobs, and more stability, all of these things that stand and fall together, in my view. So this is the motivation, including why now, uh, it, in a way, it draws some of the inspiration to the fact that Italy was holding the semester presidency in uh, 
in, in, in 2014, and uh, that in that occasion, the Italian presidency uh, put on the table the emphasis on putting growth, jobs, and investment at uh, the center of, of the policy debate, rather than the old-fashioned debate between yes or no to austerity or yes or no to flexibility, which is the new version of the old-fashioned debate. Um, the urgency of a policy response, I think, is now being uh, increased by the fact that in addition to the uh, dismal situation still of the, of the European economy in terms of employment, in terms of support, other challenges are already hitting Europe. And let me mention three challenges. One is the migrant issue. The other one is terrorism. And the third one is Brexit. Uh, they are very different challenges, of course, but they have one element in common, that they may generate, ultimately, a situation similar to a perfect storm by which the forces that keep Europe together fall apart so that we can enter a stage of disintegration rather than integration, which is exactly the opposite of what Europe needs and what Europeans need. So this is the general introduction. Let me now go quickly to the elements of this policy package, many of which are not new, but which I hope can be uh, reconsidered in terms of simple principles. Uh, let me also add one little methodological element uh, which we followed in drafting this document. There are three points which we think should be kept in mind when one thinks on how to design the economic policy framework for Europe. Uh, the first one is that, is linked to what I just said, is that the progress of Europe has always been associated with more, not less integration. Uh, which can be uh, articulated in a number of ways at a number of levels and a number of issues, but that's the basic point. The second element is that uh, as we move towards a more integrated institutional framework for economic policy, uh, one should combine and uh, progress in parallel two principles, one of risk mitigation and the other one of risk sharing. This is particularly relevant as this is part of the strategy of exiting the, uh, the legacy of the financial crisis. And the third element is that uh, nation states, members of the European Union, of the Euro area, may well uh, implement national adjustment policies, and they should, but this should be coupled by uh, adjustment policies at the system level, in other words, uh, Europe is a system, Europe is a one, and therefore the consistency of the single parts should be preserved. So what are the chapters of where do we stand if we try to describe what the European policy framework looks like? The first one is what I would call uh, economic surveillance. Uh, you're familiar with uh, the sometimes uh, uh, not so transparent language that puts together things like the two-pack, the six-pack, of course, the stability and growth pact. But basically, where we stand today, at least as I see it from my daily experience, is that there is a structure in which there must be some combination of fiscal policy and structural policy. This combination has to do both with the content of structural policy and fiscal policy, and with the distribution of structural policy and fiscal policy, keeping in mind that both uh, levels of policy not only impact, obviously, the national economic, national economic stance, but they have important spillover impacts. So one first element uh, is that more attention should be devoted to the uh, uh, systemic implications of fiscal and structural policy. What does that mean in practice? In fiscal policy, it means two things. First of all, that uh, there, is, there are benefits from coordination. I, I tend, given my age, I still remember the hot debate uh, when there was uh, very serious attempts in the, in the literature, in the academic and policy discussion to show that if you coordinate national policies, there is a net gain. So it's a welfare improving situation. Have we, have we lost that? I don't think we should have lost it. So let's go back to that point and let's articulate it in a European fashion, which among other things, mean one thing. 
uh, fiscal policy adjustment and macroeconomic policy adjustment should be more symmetric, and you know what I mean. The second element is about structural policy. Uh, structural policies are national policies almost by definition. But in a highly integrated area, if one country goes structural and implements structural measures which uh, presumably uh, improve the growth potential and the effectiveness of market adjustment, this has benefits on the neighbors. So there is scope there for looking at the spillovers from the structural policy agenda. Third element, structural and fiscal policy interact with each other. This is a point that in, during my OECD years was very well understood. Now I see that this is becoming uh, common wisdom, including in, in very important IMF documents as the ones that are supporting the meetings now just about to start. And of course, it has become uh, fundamental, instrumental in the G20 discourse where this uh, element of interaction is well understood. This is, to me, not just a technical uh, consideration of the fact that uh, uh, there is an interaction between what you do on the fiscal and what you do on the structural. It has to do with incentives. Uh, if there is a policy link, and I'm thinking of the so-called flexibility uh, story in Europe, if there is a link between your path of fiscal adjustment and what you do in the structural domain, to me this is not uh, fiscal undiscipline. I know if you hear it from an Italian you're always suspicious, but the case is that this is not fiscal being fiscal, uh, fiscally uh, uh, not disciplined, but this is about incentives for structural reforms. If we believe, as we should, that the reform effort it's a multi-year phenomenon by definition, so it doesn't expire in one budget year. It, it, uh, it, it has to be allowed to, to work through. And in addition, this comes from my, my country's personal experience, there is a lot of uh, synergies between what you, what you can do in the structural domain and what, with what you do with the fiscal domain. One example is tax incentives for new contracts in an environment in which the labor market reform uh, greatly emphasizes the move towards open-ended contracts in the labor market so that the net result is to get you, that you get more and better employment, as we say, uh, when we look at the already visible results of the structural reform in my country, at least. So this is about uh, more or less the, uh, the, the macroeconomic dimension. And this is also about the... Uh, uh, the structural dimension. Uh, the question that uh, is posed here is, uh, do we need new institutions to deal with that? I will argue later that we may need new institutions in the fiscal sphere, but I'll come to that because that implies uh, most likely treaty changes, which is something that, of course, you cannot do now. The other element which is already there is um, investment. Uh, the European Commission put out a so-called Juncker plan uh, some time ago with the, as I understood it at least, with the very obvious purpose of having a public policy intervention to fill the gap between what the private sector is willing to take in terms of risk and what you need to take in terms of risk in order to, to, to have long-term investment, especially in, in infrastructure. Here what uh, in, in, in our case is, is needed is that the scope of this approach should be expanded, not so much in terms of resources, but especially in terms of areas uh, where uh, investment should be directed. And this is also linked to another point I'll come to in a moment. What is the growth driver? What should be the ultimate growth driver of Europe looking forward? So again, a useful instrument, the Juncker plan, uh, which is basically uh, working on the efforts of the European Investment Bank uh, more scope to be uh, expanded, more resources if needed, uh, more scope especially uh, uh, in supporting uh, uh, immaterial infrastructure, knowledge infrastructure, and, and innovation. Then we come to an issue which is uh, very much at the center of the current policy debate, completing banking union. Uh, banking union is indeed one of the most remarkable institutional transformations that Europe has gone through since the euro crisis broke out. If you look back at 2010, uh, you all remember there was no such a thing as a banking union. There was a problem, not so much a country, but an interaction between uh, banks' balance sheets and, and public sector balance sheets. 
So this banking union idea was, if I remember correctly, was sparked off exactly with the purpose of uh, eliminating, cutting down this, uh, this negative uh, link. So we have a banking union, which is now one pillar and three quarters ready, which is the uh, single supervisory mechanism. Uh, we have a resolution mechanism, we have a resolution authority, we have a resolution resources, but not yet fully in place. Uh, we don't have the third pillar, which is the common deposit insurance scheme. Uh, why is this crucial? Well, for two reasons, because this is where uh, we could say, once we have completed the reform, that we have gone past the legacy of the financial crisis. Uh, being in, in the U.S. today, uh, I always, uh, I, I like to point out that seen from Europe, the, sequen the policy sequencing that was adopted in this country to deal with the financial crisis, which basically fix the finance first and then look at fiscal, was relatively more efficient than the other things that was apparently followed in Europe. Fix the fiscal first for heaven's sake uh, and then look at the financial, which Europe means mostly the banking sector. So now we have a very powerful and heavy and articulated banking sector reform, uh, which has been, is now being put into practical action. And this is where uh, I strongly, we strongly invoke the attention to the dual principles of risk re reduction and mitigation and risk sharing. We need to go along both lines. And this is not because of some 50-50 idea, but because I strongly believe that they mutually reinforce each other. This is about incentives, let's face it. It's not about technicalities. It's about whether or not member countries are willing to share and mutualize some common targets. And when you, do, when you deal with financial systems, it's very hard to believe that each single component of the financial system is separated from the rest. What you do with one bank believe it or not, and the bank may be even small, this has implications for the rest of the system. And they may be good implications or bad implications. So you need to deal with a, an externality impact uh, which requires forms of risk sharing in addition to risk, mi risk mitigation. Why am I saying this? Because let's face it, this is no, no secret. Views across the membership of the euro area and also the European Union differ significantly in, in uh, what should be more given more importance. Is it risk sharing or risk mitigation and what should come first? This has a very practical bearing today because the policy agenda of ECOFIN over the next few, next few months is exactly about these issues. And uh, there is one problem here that uh, we still don't know, certainly I don't know fully, how the implementation of the new system of rules will impact on the banking system. What I have in mind is that uh, we have done a lot in terms of risk mitigation by introducing the so-called bail-in mechanism, the BRRD, uh, which leaves very little space to deal with emergency or fragility situations until you have gone through a sequencing of adjustment which bears uh, which uh, bears the blunt mostly on individual uh, banking units rather than on the system. And in the meantime, you uh, find yourself hoping that there will be no systemic impacts on what you do at an individual level. I'm pressing the point a little bit, to be, to be fair. But this is just to draw the attention to the fact that we are now in a very delicate phase in Europe. We are phasing in, in practice, a new system which is highly complex, which is basically uh, strictly looking at uh, respecting accounting rules and, and prudential rules, but leaving much less space than it used to be in terms of how you manage uh, emergency situations and backstop and situations where you need a backstop. On top of that, uh, you have to deal, and this is again comes from my uh, personal experience with another set of rules which now sit not so much with the ECB uh, but sit with the European Commission and these have to do with state aid uh, provisions which uh, quite heavily limit 
what a country can do in setting up instruments that require public support of some kind, even when the money is private, uh, to deal with emergency situations. So this is a really a, a, a crucial point where we go from here, and if we are able in practice to put, uh, to put uh, these two elements together. This has an immediate implication. This is mostly drawn by my personal experience here. This has immediate implications on the issue of is Europe a good or a bad idea for the citizens? Because in some cases, even uh, as you know, in, in my country we have witnessed a, a very minor uh, bank uh, crisis situation dealing with, with four small banks which amount to aggregate, on the aggregate less to 1% of the market size. Uh, in, in spite of that, the uh, implementation of uh, partial bail-in rules the, um, because of the transition period had, has had significant impacts in terms of risk perception in, in households and, and therefore in attitude vis-a-vis -vis the banking system. This is a, a, it was a very hard awakening to reality on how we should implement these measures. Let me go on because I'm taking too much time out of the time I allocated myself myself. Uh, going forward, what about long-term growth? Here uh, I'm old-fashioned like in many other areas. I think that we are still missing a, a great opportunity uh, with, uh, with the incomplete single market project. Uh, single market project is now sliced up in a number of sectors. Uh, what we propose here is something more ambitious and more difficult to implement. What we like to call an innovation Union, uh, innovation union, which should bring together what some, in the past uh, scholars used to call innovation systems, meaning how the uh, different uh, institutions that have a bear, have a bearing on innovation activities interact. So not just the research community, but also human capital, education, the financial sector, uh, the. Uh, the competition degree so that a business can exploit opportunities and so forth, and things such as public administration reform to speed up investment projects, and things such as civil justice, which are essential to defining whether an investment is uh, worth undertaking or not. So the proposal here is go back and pick up again the uh, single market idea and oriented towards uh, especially innovation in and in uh, conjunction with what a, renowned, a, re a renewed Juncker plan can do. Uh, on the single market, there is one political element which I think is also very important. The extent to which the EU countries re reboost their political investment on the single market, this is a strong element to tie together the 28 with the euro area members, the ins and outs, if you wish. The euro area, the, the single market is one area where I think there is much less disagreement than there is in other areas. And therefore, there is a lot of scope for building up a political consensus on a European project in ways that may be not so easy in other cases. I'm quickly going towards the end uh, with three elements which are a bit more innovative in the picture. One is not an innovative idea, but politically maybe it's innovative. It's uh, a common in unemployment insurance mechanism for the euro area. Uh, this uh, is very simple. It's an old idea which, draw, which has a very strong rationale to me. A, single, uh, a monetary union is something which does not have internal exchange rates, right? We agree on that. So whenever you have an adjustment in a member of the European Union, of the monetary union, what do you get? You get that most of the blunt is on the labor market. And this, again, is inefficient, painful, and not good for the European idea. So why not, in, uh, why not introduce a cyclical unemployment insurance mechanism, which is typically a risk sharing mechanism? I underline, I stress the cyclical component because the structural component requires different policies, requires structural policies. This would be funded jointly by the euro area countries. And this would also give the signal that monetary union is not just about banks and, and currency. It's also about jobs and work. 
The uh, other element which uh, we uh, in, uh, include in the document is, quote unquote, a European finance minister. Uh, I'm not looking for a new job. Uh, I'm just saying that there might be a set of functions which require an ad hoc institution. And the functions I have in mind are, first of all, someone really in charge of fiscal policy coordination, which I mentioned earlier, number one. Number two, someone in charge of what I would call European public goods. Let me give you an example. The uh, European refugee crisis has a huge economic cost, which so far has been, uh, has been addressed by extending national contributions. So very much on an ad hoc basis. But if we believe that, unfortunately, emergencies such as the migrants will continue to put pressure on Europe, we have a European public good, namely European borders, which must be serviced, not in terms of uh, guns and, 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 and boats or military, but in terms of having a common policy vis-a-vis -vis refugees, including policies to help people stay possibly in the countries they are fleeing from. Uh, and another, uh, another common good is what, unfortunately and dramatically, the terrorist attack have produced to be a, a, a vacuum in the European institutions, a common security structure uh, which uh, would deal on a European level with these. From, and you can think of other things. So a European finance minister would look at the European element of fiscal policy would look at uh, how to deal with the European public goods and by implication would have to deal with a very controversial area which is how should Europe raise common resources and here of course we can open up a huge chapter on common taxation schemes and forgive me God, euro bonds, uh, a dirty word to some stage. Uh, all kinds of things. So there is a need of an institution, not because we like to multiply the institutions, but because there are functions, Europe truly European functions, which are not delivered by truly European institutions. That's the point. And of course, from here, you can develop uh, along these lines in asking what kind of fiscal union should we be looking for. The uh, third and final element is uh, well, something which, of course, is, is, is very uh, is discussed a lot, how to uh, strengthen the uh, European uh, crisis management mechanism, and in, in short, how to transform the European stability mechanism in a fully-fledged European monetary fund. Uh, all of these things, and I'll just stop there, and I'm finished, all of these things have one element in common uh, from the point of view of the items I described earlier. They stress uh, instruments that look at risk sharing as essential components of building a European strategy. Um, many of these things require treaty change. Some of these things don't require treaty change. For instance, the common unemployment insurance scheme, believe it or not, can be done with the current treaty. So it's a question of political decision. Uh, to conclude, can we do all these things? Uh, there is one element which in my way stands, in my, in, my, in, in my idea stands in the way of achieving more risk sharing mechanism and more integrated uh, policy instruments. And that is uh, lack of mutual confidence. Um, much of the European policy machinery as I have interpreted it, is sometimes paradoxically not about achieving the goals for which the, the given rules have been drawn, but it's about proving yourself as being loyal to the rules. Now, of course, loyalty to the rules is essential, and uh, if I may say so, my government makes that a very strong point. We, there is sometimes a criticism sometimes very vocal, not by me, but by, but, but the, by the young boss I back, back in Rome. Uh, it's very vocal about the fact that he doesn't like some rules. At the same time, the idea is not, if you, if you don't like a rule, you still have to respect the rule as long as the rule is in, in force. So the idea is, how can we change the rule together? 
And this requires having common mutual trust in each other. And this is the element which is linking. And I am concerned, and this is to conclude my presentation, that this element is present today when the dimension and intensity uh, of, of challenges is such that the risk of disintegration is a severe and present uh, danger. Let me just conclude uh, with one obvious element, the Schengen Treaty. If because, say, of failure to have a European response to the migrant issue, countries start uh, dismantling the Schengen agreements and they go national to deal with these problems rather than going Europeans, then what is, that, what is uh, this showing is that there is a national refusal to deal with common problems which invokes nationalism and since the political climate, I'm sorry to be so gloomy, in Europe is not very favorable uh, from that point of view, uh, this may generate a domino effect which could be much more damaging than say a repeat of the Euro area crisis which I'm not looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Padawan. I, that was wonderful, ambitious without being fantastic in the sense of, of untethered and topical without being merely short term. Um, so we're very excited to have you here to provide a forum for you to express those ideas. Thank you. Uh, we have a very distinguished audience, so I'm gonna restrain myself more than usual in terms of my own questions. But let, let me pose one to you in particular. You made mention of the idea of linking structural reforms that eventually pay, if not pay for themselves, certainly pay in growth, to some flexibility on some of the fiscal criteria. Um, we actually talked about this earlier with uh, your colleague, um, Minister Dyselblum. And um, we are aware that the commission did have some flexibility of this sort in place. And in fact, Italy did apply for this flexibility. And we talked about this this morning. But as far as we know, Italy is the only country to have made such a proposal to the commission to date of trying to get additional flexibility in return for structural reforms, even though the principle's there. So I was wondering if you could just expand a bit on Italy's own experience with this and what you think you can do to incentivize some of the other countries, the other members, to pursue this kind of trade-off. Okay, Adam, thanks for the question. Uh, it's never been put to me. <laughs> I think every question has been put to you 10,000 times, so don't blame me for that. <laughs> just kidding. Thanks for that. No, no, this is a... Well, first of all, the uh, two things, one in general about the flexibility clauses and, and communication, the other one about the Italian case. The flexibility clauses uh, basically sta state that if a country uh, effectively uh, promotes a program of structural reform, number one, and or promotes effectively a program of public investment so that you can envisage from those policies an improvement in the long-term growth or your potential output growth, then this can be uh, facilitated by the fact that more time is given to the country to adjust the so-called to, to the so-called MTO, the medium-term objective, in terms of structural adjustment. So there is a shift of the time horizon. Um, so from that point of view, the fiscal benefit is temporary if you... Uh, if you provide evidence, and this evidence is accepted, that you have the structural reforms in place. Uh, not all countries can uh, apply for flexibility because in order to uh, apply for flexibility, you must be 
at your turn, in fiscal order, meaning you must be uh, not in the corrective arm, but in the so-called preventive arm. Right. And if you are not in the preventive arm, even if you do structural reforms, you're not entitled to apply. Uh, having said that, uh, one element which always is brought up in the discussion with different uh, approaches according to how much you love the country is Italy is asking for too much flexibility. And the standard reply there is very easy. Italy is applying for all the flexibility that is allowed under the rules. And given that, believe it or not, Italy seems to be more disciplined from a fiscal point of view than other countries. We were given flexibility because we complied with the preventive arm requirements. And we also had what was uh, judged to be a credible structural reform and investment uh, program. Now, this if you accumulate the investment, so-called investment clause and the uh, structural reform clause, this accumulates, in theory, up to one point of GDP. Uh, subsequently, the Commission has put a cap on that, saying even if you are entitled to 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5, the most you can get is 0 0.75. And over what time span? Over for one, for, for one, one, once, one time. This is what the, uh, so you cannot continue, you cannot have a, an additional element of flexibility next year if you get it this year. Uh, this, this is what Italy has been asking and it has, what seems, what has um, been perceived as Italy asking twice is that we uh, completed our request in two slots. So first we asked for some flexibility in the structural reform and nothing on the investment. Then we realized that we could graduate for the investment clause as well, so we added another, another request, and now uh, the commission uh, is about to give us the formal response whether this has been accepted. Just to be completely transparent, the current document of economy and finance, which is our public policy and macro framework, incorporates the flexibility clauses, so we are assuming that uh, we will be entitled to, to have that. No other country is enjoying flexibility, because, not because, to my knowledge, there was no request. I can think of a two or three countries, which I will not mention, that actually advanced the request, but because they were not judged to be, uh, to be complying with the rules. Very good. Thank you. Let me open it up to our audience. Um, there is a traveling microphone in front. There is a standing microphone in back. I think all of you know our operating procedures, but just when you are recognized, please identify yourself and please ask a question rather than making a speech, especially since the minister has to leave promptly at 3.32. Uh, the, gent the tall gentleman there in front. The tall gentleman will remain seated. Uh, Lucio Vinha de Souza, I had the economic team on the advisory services to President Juncker. Uh, Minister Paduan, thanks for showing that contrary to uh, rumors, the ministers of finance of the euro area do understand the fiscal framework of the European Union. On a more serious point, uh, it's very comforting to see that you are exposing several themes that we are going to be discussing on the second half of the year when you enter the second stage of the five presidents' report of the reform of the euro area governance framework. Including deposit, including unemployment insurance, including a treasury for the euro area. If you allow me, uh, one of the proposals that we put earlier in the year, namely the um, allegedly missing uh, leg of the banking union, the deposit insurance, has been for several months at a stage of discussion, both at the level of ECOFIN and at the level of Council. Uh, that illustrates one of the constraints that we face when we propose policy, which is how to make a proposal which is politically acceptable to all the member states. If you could indicate to us, as a practical example of the difficulties for that, where we are in terms of deposit insurance, just as an illustration of the difficulties that might be associated with other policy proposals that you yourself have just outlined to us. Or, or maybe you'll tell us about where things stand on deposit insurance because it's actually important and isn't just alleged to be missing. Um, on, the, on the deposit insurance scheme, uh, there are a number of proposals on the table. 
there are proposals from some countries that prefer to keep it more national rather than uh, mutualized. Uh, we think that we need a fully mutualized deposit insurance scheme. Of course, this is very delicate, especially in the transition, because basically uh, in those countries where this idea is resisted, the reaction would be, why should my depositors and my taxpayers put, pay for risks generated in other banking systems and therefore have a transfer of resources from the good guys to the bad guys? Uh, this is a very... Uh, blunt simplification, but it, it captures some of the political discourse. Then there are intermediate proposals. The Commission, for instance, has put on the table an intermediate proposal, which uh, offers a combination of national schemes and, and some mutualization element. Uh, as I've said already, uh, we are not extremely happy about the, com the Commission proposal, but we are less happy with the proposal of other countries that are fully national. This is going to be a very uh, important uh, element on its own sake, but also because it will be uh, discussed during a period in which the banking union itself is going uh, in a, towards a phasing in mechanism of, of the resolution uh, procedure. So it's going to be very difficult in terms of managing uh, the, the results, and also very important in terms of sending the message how much, how far can we, can we go in terms of mutualization on these very uh, delicate issues. Thank you. The next question at the back, bonus points if you do something more original than I asked. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your illuminating remarks. I'm Nicolas Veron. I work here at the Institute and also at Bruegel in Brussels. Hi, Nicolas. Um, my question is also about banking union, but seen from a different angle and the angle is banking system in Italy. So there were reports uh, in the last few days of uh, a private sector fund, uh, Atlante, uh, managed by a private sector fund management company, Questio SDR, uh, which uh, from media reports seems to uh, have emerged partly as a consequence of discussions involving your ministry and the public authorities of Italy. And a perception, one way it was described to me was Italian money to fix the Italian banks. And some perceptions in the marketplace is that part of the intention of this fund is to prevent the arrival of money from outside Italy, including private equity fund managers like uh, Apollo is trying with Carige in Genoa, uh, which was interpreted or is being interpreted by some market participants as a bit of you know, keeping it inside the country. Uh, so my question is the following. How, how do you describe the intent of the fund? Can you give us a bit of a sense of how it connects with the general vision of banking union and especially this idea of a single uh, banking market in the Eurozone that is not defined by national borders? Thank you very much. Well, there is a mix of rumors, national and European stuff there. Uh, first of all... Uh, i like not to comment on, on one part of your point, which you reported from the press, it's not yours, which really sounds very much like a gossip to me. The fact that such an initiative were to be set up because we want to keep out the bad guys out of the Italian banking system. Uh, this is not the point. The point is that this is a fully private initiative with private money put together on a voluntary basis and managed by a, a private sector uh, wealth management company. Uh, the purpose is of, of this fund, Atlante, Atlas, is twofold. On the one hand, to provide a backstop uh, mechanism for capitalization of banks, a backstop, not a direct capitalization. Backstop is something that comes in, I don't have to tell you, if needed. The other one is to provide private money, private investment going into the NPL issue, which of course is still hanging out there in uh, in numbers which are relevant, although sometimes they're misunderstood in their real meaning. Um, so the idea is not to keep the bad guys. The idea is to avoid that valuable assets, banking assets, are sold at a price which does not reflect those, those values. And if you are under stress, of course, you are uh, pressed hard to, to sell at whatever price. 
this is at the same time a private sector response which to me signals that the Italian banking sector is strong enough to provide uh, self-made solutions, number one. And number two, it is a, uh, how would I call it, a response which takes into account the fact that given the new rules in, uh, phased in in 2013 about state aid regulations in the banking sector, the role that the state can take up in terms of resources and, and support is much more limited than in the past. So this is, the, this is one example of what I was saying, that the general banking system framework in Europe, also because of the competition, competition regulations, is much more difficult to deal with than it used to be. Let me add one, one piece of information. What has been the role of uh, the institutions? Of course, the government, but also the Bank of Italy, has been to facilitate to, to look at a, a history hold problem, coordination failure, when you're dealing with private sector. So we provided some facilitation uh, uh, um, effort to bring together the banks and to put them around the table so that they can exchange views and put their own money. But it's also something else. What the government is going to be doing over the next few days is to introduce measures which we believe will significantly accelerate the time needed to deal with the bankruptcy procedures. So if, if you need much less time to uh, recuperate uh, some of your assets, this increases the value of your assets. That's as simple as that. So this is where what the public policy leg of this, instrument, of this uh, initiative uh, will do. Very good, thank you. Uh, at the back and then in front. Uh, Fred Bergstead here at the Peterson Institute. A question based on your participation in the G20 finance ministers' uh, meetings. There has been speculation in the markets and elsewhere that at your recent meeting in Shanghai, there was agreement, explicit or implicit, on a kind of package to deal with the world's economic problems. Uh, that the Fed might go a little easier on tightening, uh, that the ECB and Bank of Japan might go for uh, more uh, QE than interest rate cuts, uh, some fiscal stimulus in China and maybe a couple of other places, uh, all with the objective of avoiding the risk of a big devaluation in China and avoid the risk of further strengthening of the dollar. Uh, could you shed any light on that and tell us whether that indicates kind of a new beginning, at least, of some international policy cooperation uh, to deal with the global difficulties? As far as I recall, there was no secret deal at G20 Shanghai. There was a continuation of the discourse which has been started off recently that in the face of what seems to be an increasingly difficult economic environment. Uh, we need to uh, work hard to make the best of the existing policy toolkit and basically uh, ask the question, how do the different policy tools uh, interact with each other in a way that is possibly uh, positive rather than negative? So uh, more interaction between the fiscal dimension and the structural dimension. Uh, more role to long-term investment and therefore the question how can financial markets provide resources and uh, in, in incorporate risk-taking for long-term investment in infrastructure and how can we do that in a coordinated way. So I would say no secret deal but the uh, uh, knowledge that we, we need to act in different economic situations with different tools at our disposal but in ways that the externalities are uh, uh, incorporated so that the traditional, if you wish, the traditional benefits from coordination are made explicit. Very good. Here in front. Uh, I'm Glenn Fukushima of the Center for American Progress. I'd like to ask you about the notion of a European finance minister. Um, I can see the benefits of such an organization or institution. Can you tell us uh, what the likelihood is and who would be pressing it, um, advocating it the most, and also one might think that when you mentioned issues like European common goods, like the refugee issue and the issue of terrorism, that these should be better handled by another institution that handles European public goods, and that the finance minister actually should deal with the coordination of financial and monetary policy. But what, what, what is, first of all, the likelihood uh, of, of a European finance minister and its role 
and, and you know, what, what, uh, what countries would be most in favor of it. And I suppose you know, some people in Britain, for instance, who are wanting to exit might actually oppose such a notion, thinking that it would increase uh, Central European supervision over Britain. So I'd like you to elaborate on this. Thank you. Uh, just for your reference, uh, earlier this morning, Commissioner Moscovici spoke here, and he also expressed a personal desire to, that there should be a European finance minister. Um, how likely? Uh, well, likely in the long term, because this is one of the ultimate examples of mutualization. This is about, uh, one could say, it's about as difficult as the idea and establishment of the ECB. Remember the times when the ECB was not there, and uh, this was a huge transfer of sovereignty. Now, in the case of, of fiscal policy, this is even more demanding and has obvious implications of how to deal with the legitimacy of this institution, what is the relationship with the parliament, uh, to what extent there is a budget, which is not the current EU budget, but a new instrument, a new fiscal instrument. So it's very complicated. Uh, but the point I want to underline is, do we need such an institution? My answer is yes, and I can think of a number of them, including coordination, but also including public goods in the sense that these, dealing with these public goods has a very large financial dimension. So you may need a, a common interior minister or a common defense minister or a common uh, border police, but you also need the resources to deal with those. And you cannot simply count on the fact that you go ask the member states, can you please give me a billion or two if you, you can spare them for that. So you, you must change the way resources are raised and are allocated. Okay, this will be the last question, please. Uh, Jacob Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute. I would actually like to, for you to just follow up on the last point you just made about raising the resources. Because I personally, first of all, like the paper a lot. But one of the most innovative parts of it was actually the very explicit calls you had for joint, potential joint bond financing of uh, the refugee issue. Uh, uh, because it's often said whenever you raise the issue of more Europe, that there isn't any political will for that. Well, I guess I would submit that there is actually a fairly elaborate will in Europe for more external border control uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, and we also know that this costs money. It costs a lot of money uh, uh, and therefore cannot be done uh, within the in in existing uh, European Union, or sorry, EU budget. Um, so we need to have some new instruments there. Uh, uh, and I guess I would submit that uh, if we accept the fact that currently the uh, emergency uh, situation on the Greek border seems to be by hook and crook to have been reduced to a politically acceptable level of inflows, uh, uh, Italy is going to be f uh, uh, the next uh, front line probably uh, over the summer, uh, uh, potentially at least. So I guess my, my question to you is, what do you intend to do to pursue this idea, if anything? And is there anything we can do to help besides publishing Jacob, which we're already doing, uh, uh, <laughs> advocating this kind of thing? I think that what can be done by, by you and all of those who are interested is to work and elaborate the idea of European public goods and demonstrate that there's no effective national solutions to European challenges. This is, I think, a point which needs to be elaborated. Um, on, on what we should expect. Well, let me, since you mentioned Italy, uh, let me mention one fact that for a few years, Italy was the only country bearing the blunt of migration pressures. And for a period of time, which was not short, the European authorities did not accept the idea that this was a European issue. They said, this is an Italian issue, you deal with it. We could give you some money on the side, but that's not the point. Once the, the dimension of the problem raised by size, but also by uh, quality, so to speak, and impacted directly on other countries, then this became a European issue. Uh, it is a European issue, the solution is still not European. Uh, we're still not agreeing on common uh, immigration policy which goes beyond the emergency. We're still not agreeing on how to reallocate or relocate 
those immigrants. And we're not agreeing on what should be a component of that policy, that is to say, invest in the neighboring countries so that uh, migrant flows are, are at least minimized so that because people want to stay where they, they were born. And this is a major challenge for Europe. Certainly, the North African uh, part of, of, of the African continent is still uh, an area where those issues need to be dealt with. I'm thinking, of, of course, about Libya, for instance. Great. Well, uh, you had generously included us in your schedule and maintained the space here, uh, even though your schedule changed. I promised to get you out by... 3.32, and I think we're there. Um, I hope you enjoyed your respite at the Institute. We are delighted to have had you back, and again, to have you advancing such a substantive and far-reaching agenda for others to consider. Uh, please join me in thanking Minister Padawan. Thank you very much.